Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Brightworks, and I hope you're having a great Friday. Well, unless you're watching this in the future, then I just hope you're having a great rest of your day in that case. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a match that was played a none, under, none other than the well-known All That Glitters. I do every once in a while like to take a look at this map. I feel like, as nice as it is, the variety of maps and beyond all reasons, sometimes what you want is the stability of knowing exactly what build orders work and what the meta is and how you can play. Definitely helpful, especially if you're getting to learn the game. Speaking of getting to learn the game, our blue team leader here is a fellow YouTube content creator, somebody who's been working hard on a whole bunch of tutorial videos as of late. They go by the name of Jaws Munch. Going to be playing as an Arm Armada commander here. Well, really losing my words. Pardon me. Just got out of a final exam, so my brain is fried. We're going to be working through this together as we take a look at this game. This is my rest and relaxation game, so hopefully it can be that for you too. A little bit of a longer side game. Definitely a little bit in the middle as far as the true skill values go as well. So we're going to be taking it nice and easy. Jaws Munch going to be playing as an Armada commander. Looked like they were planning on going into vehicles here shortly after building quite a lot of wind turbines. Ah, that wind speed. Just awful. It's wind speeds like this that would convince a man, yes, even myself, to go into solar panels. As disgusting as it is, sometimes sacrifices must be made. Drop the hundred or so metal to put into a solar panel just so that you can maybe have enough energy to go into your vehicle bay. At this point, we are how many metal or uh, wind turbines, pardon me, deep? Nine wind turbines deep. And we finally get to start with the vehicle bay. Man, that, that sucks. And only for it to immediately start climbing up again. Ugh. One of the problems with wind, certainly. Anywho, across the map here, representing the red team in the back line, goes by the name of Sanctastego. The red team commander here, playing as an armada commander, going for quite a healthy amount of wind turbines here. I'd love to see the mexes come up first. Definitely want to prioritize those mexes over the wind turbines, especially if you're going to be going for bots, which do require quite a lot of energy. Well, maybe that's not fair to say. All of the units require quite a lot of energy. Hold on, is the... Music playing? There we go. Orion Kraus coming in smoothly with the Divergence. They uh, added a whole bunch of music, including a bunch of lobby music, which is just fabulous. I've been extremely vocal about it in the past, but the music in a video game pretty much sells it for me. If a game doesn't have a banging soundtrack, I just have a really hard time getting into it, and Beyond All Reason definitely does uh, have a banging soundtrack, that is. Couple of rovers across the map already for Elm, our Canadian player, hailing with 20 true skill and a silver tail of Chevron to speak of. Going to be sending these rovers across the map here, followed by a couple of rascals right now from Poif, the 19 true skill American hero. We also have a scout plane coming out here. Beautiful aggression by the blue team. Love to see it. There are a couple of blitzes headed across the map right here, as well as a couple of ticks sent out by the red commander. This air scout is fabulous. If we take a look at this right now, yeah, that's really nice. So we know where everybody on the blue team is at this, sorry, where the red team is at this point. Nice snipe right there, by the way. Popping some energy converters. Very good to see. Wind turbines going down to those rascals as well in the back line. This is just lovely right here for the blue team. Definitely pulling out all the stops here to put the smack down on the red team. However, blitzes were not dealt with. Not addressed whatsoever. And there they are. Now aggressing into a constructor on one hand. And raw economy on the back. Very nice. I say two to three metal extractors, and this blitz has been well paid for. 109 metal, so I guess technically speaking, two metal extractors is about paid for the blitz. Not gonna happen though. Roofmach in position to degun down that blitz. That's quite nice. The other one was cleaned up by the grunts over here. Didn't manage to snipe the mechs right here. That's a bit of a bummer. Oh no, it wasn't cleaned up. My bad. That is the uh, corpse of a corpse of a grunt right over there, not the corpse of the blitz. In that case, the ticks have also done a tremendous amount of damage over here on this side of the map, and eventually this is all cleaned up. But yeah, that is, uh, that is some good hurt right there. Very good to see. Aggression on both sides from both teams. Always important. Easy to underestimate just how important that aggression early on can be, but it really does make or break your early game, uh, especially if you're going to be going up against a vehicle player. If you're seeing they're going up against a bot player, sometimes that aggression can be more uh, cost inefficient. It can, it can cost you more metal to be aggressive than it does to just build up your forces and trade th against their army. But especially if you're going to go bots and especially, especially Armada bots with that tick being so inexpensive, but so deadly, it can really make a lot of sense to do quite a lot of damage. Obviously any amount of eco damage you can do to the opponent, pretty much always going to be worth it. It's these micro efficiencies though, that really matter over the span of the game. Little things start to add up and eventually they add up to quite a lot. Mimi 121314 
Having me read out the Konami code here for the Green Commander. Going to be marching to the front lines here. A little bit strange. Usually what we see out of this player is either they go for a full-blown support build, so they go for uh, just a whole bunch of T2 all as quick as possible, or they go for something like a, uh, a spam lab. So you just go for maybe a spam of medium tanks or a spam of Janus's or a spam of just about anything. Speaking of Janus's, two massive connections from those Janus tanks, whittling down the heavy armor right here on some of those brown medium tanks right there for MB3. Nice connection right there for our blue commander. Janus tanks make a lot of sense right here. Very efficient in that choke point. All those units are going to be forced to ball up. And as soon as they do, those Janus's can really let them have it. Boom, boom, go the Janus missiles. Away they fly and directly into the armor of those medium tanks. Just about exactly where you want them. Important that you don't lose the Janus's. They're definitely one of those units that has to be repeatedly fired over and over again to really get their value out. 240 metal apiece is not crazy compared to the 225 for a medium tank, but definitely Janus is much lighter armored, but high, higher damage. They're a very, very raw D DPS sort of a unit. Commander sacrifice in the back line for the blue team. No such sacrifice right here for the red team. Although uh, Lawlington is pretty close to that T2 lab. I'd love to see the commander still sacrificed here just so that we could use the metal to actually pump out T2 constructors. I think that wouldn't be a bad investment right here for the Tan Commander. We are going to see some Constructors handed over here as well. That's always good to see. Makes me believe in a team's proficiency together whenever I see T2 Constructors being handed out. Gamer Guy with a very far forward push here. Completely out of energy to fund the LLTs right here, but not bad. Denying some of that surface area, some of that concave, that natural concave that this area over here provides. Makes it... Quite a bit easier to get units through as well, and indeed the Orange Commander going to be sending a couple of them through. We have uh, spectators in the chat here, drawing up a storm, trying to keep the map clear as much as possible anyways. Yeah, Pwaf, not wanting to let the Hot Pink Commander take control over that metal extractor for too long. Definitely a good idea. A little medium tank run by, I think eventually this will be cleaned up over here on the left hand side. Front lines are still developing, so we'll just keep our eyes on these Brutes that are trying to sneak past right now. Incisor-Brute combination is quite powerful, although I'd love to see these Incisors on the other side of the Brutes. Basically activating the flanking bonus can definitely make your entire composition quite a lot stronger. The Tick's doing effectively the same thing here. I believe eventually this is going to be cleaned up. So this is what I was talking about as far as how cost inefficient it can be to do eco damage consider that each of these brutes costs 235 metal per brute if you break that down into per metal extractors that's essentially four call it five metal extractors in order to uh in order to pay for your brute and that's just in the metal the, the metal that goes into the metal extractors not the metal that's lost over time obviously the longer the metal extractor is down the bigger the loss so uh, it's kind of a, kind of up to player dependent at that point, but essentially what I'm trying to say is that these brutes have to do a lot of eco damage to be worth the amount of metal that you're leaving over on the enemy side of the map here. If these brutes end up not doing a whole bunch of eco damage, unlike what they're doing right now, which is a fabulous amount of eco damage, you end up donating quite a lot of metal here. So I do like how much damage these brutes have been doing in this particular game here. Not always the case, though. We've definitely seen this backfire quite a lot when those brutes charge forward, get shut down efficiently, and then end up not really being able to do all too much later because there's just not enough of them. All said and done, though, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, plus a couple more over around here, seven, eight, nine metal extractors going down right there for those medium tanks. I think that's probably worth it. Going to slow down the economy right here of the blue team on the left-hand side, which is important because that left-hand side is the one that typically has the advantage as far as economy goes. Jimmy Jim James, though, with a fabulous push. Thugs marching forward, left, right, and center right now, trying to blast through multiple different lines of defense. This is one of the hard things about all the glitters, is that once you break through a line, everybody has the opportunity to concave in on you, so the green commander definitely at a risk of losing a lot of this, but the blue commander is pushing forward as well. Excellent support right here. Those Janus has followed up, uh, or following up, rather, the medium tanks over on the right-hand side. Thugs continuing to jump forward. They do manage to catch the missile trucks over here as well. They're gonna even find the Eddie Show commander. Love to see some kiting right here. Uh, no such thing. Missed the first D-gun, though. Can we get another? Thugs technically out kite commanders. It's one of those weird interactions, but man, this is a brilliant, brilliant push by the blue team over on the right-hand side. My goodness, the brown commander has gone up to T2. Well, in a single metal extractor, that is. Hasn't managed to get T2 units out right here. Yeah, 
Little bit of little bit of over technology and under commitment from the red team, suddenly meaning that their entire front line has been disbarred. Beautiful, beautiful play right here from the green and blue commanders playing together. Nice Deegan right there by San Sanctus Sanctus Tego. Does get those Deegans. I'm surprised that commander survived with how many Janices were there, but just barely. By the skin of its teeth, will it manage to survive? Accidental D-gun on our own fiend right there, not ideal. Fiends ignoring the units over here, surprisingly. And at the end of the day, mostly cleaned up. Mostly. How do you take advantage of this? Well, the obvious thing is to build all these metal extractors right here. As you can imagine, this much metal extractor going back into your economy is going to be absolutely fabulous. Certainly the blue commander draws much could afford to go into T2 right now. Build a bunch of metal extractors and go into T2. We do have a bunch of airplanes causing trouble right here. Missile trucks are coming up to the front lines though, so eventually those will be pushed back just a little ways here. It is a little uncomfortable. Feels bad to lose anything to T1 Banshees because they are so paper thin. But it's certainly possible that you do. Especially without any dedicated anti-air. Jammers coming up left, right, and center right here for Poif and Rough Mac. This is so funny. Usually this is not the way that uh, all the glitters plays out. <laughs> Usually it's about exactly the opposite. We see the left-hand side crumbling eventually, or the right-hand side crumbling here, the, either of the mountain lanes. Uh, and then eventually that swings in and takes out the back line here for either of the teams. In this case, however, it was the mountain side that completely pushed through over on this. Uh, Janice is going to meet their end here as a bunch of fiends and grunts do push forward. T2 definitely a whole hell of a lot stronger than the T1 that those medium tanks were used to dealing with. Is it going to be enough, though? The important part is that we rebuild over here. We do have a Resbot trying to pick up the T2 Constructor, so that's always nice. Bomber was sent in. Bomber singular? Yeah, I believe just a single bomber was sent in. Okay. Well, it, do <laughs> it does manage to take out a whole chunk of economy right there just by crashing into it. A little bit unconventional, but I suppose it works. Taking a page out of the Legion handbook, I suppose. We're sending Banshees in over here. Tell me we have some anti-air over here. We certainly do not. Okay, well... Anti-air is nowhere to be seen for either team on any side of this map here. There we go, we do have some anti-air towers in the back. I just knew that with this much static defense, there just had to be some anti-air somewhere around here. Anywho, counterattack right through the middle of the map. Dusty just sending those medium tanks, and man, the poor Lime Green Commander has suffered so many medium tank attacks. This entire backline economy has been ravaged, in fact all these metal extractors have been ravaged. How is Jimmy Jim James affording all this? 25 metal per second. What is it coming from? I'm not even sure. I guess it's just the metal extractors, the residual metal extractors. Ah, and he does have a T2 up and running over here. That's 7.3 of it. Those T2 metal extractors, man, they are efficient. Damn good for your economy. Am I allowed to say damn? Never sure about the YouTube swearing policy. <laughs> nice push on this left-hand side, though. Yeah, gamer guy is forced to evacuate as well. We did see a T2 transition right here from the orange commander in the back. Surprisingly still making those medium tanks has T2 up and running, but hasn't got a T2 economy and is still going for medium tanks. Well, we have partial T2 economy. A couple of T2 uh, metal extractors over there, but not the whole thing. A little bit concerning. Denying this metal economy to the red team is fabulous. Claiming it for yourself would be even better. Two or three constructors marching forward to try and claim those risky forward ones. Not a crazy expense, but if you can pull it off, it definitely leads to a huge advantage. Speaking of huge advantages, though... Medium tanks in the back line here. T2 Constructor in trouble, and that's never a comfortable feeling. Especially if you paid for that T2 Constructor and you lose it. So uncomfortable to have to ask your teammates for another T2 Constructor. Feels so irresponsible. I know, I know. I just asked you for a T2 Constructor, but do you think I could get another one? Always a little awkward. T2 does stay alive right here, though, for Gamer Guy. Loses the commander, but I think it's probably a fair enough trade for all those units that went down, essentially thwarting that push that was coming in right now from the purple commander. Probably a fair enough trade. I mean, it's not like we're losing that commander's medal. We can always resurrect it or just reclaim it. Either one of those would be perfectly fine. ADS, WRX, in quite a tricky position, though. You can see, suddenly, they have this massive, massive line that they have to hold all the way on this side over here. If any amount of aggression pushes through over here, their forces are pulled exactly like this as the hounds now get jumped on by the medium tanks. For what it's worth, the medium tanks are actually jumping on those hounds quite nicely. Tricky battle, that. But you can see it spreads the forces thin here. So what Elm should be doing is sending forces in this direction, and then we should be sending forces in this direction. And eventually it means that ADS WRX, the Yellow Commander, is spread too thinly, 
And eventually, uh, well, we all know what happens to a commander that's spread too thin. And it looks like a nuclear explosion. Sounds like one, too. We do finally see some heavy tanks here. Two medium tanks costing 470 metal. Single Tiger costing 665, so maybe highlighting exactly why it's not so easy to get those medium tanks, or those uh, heavy tanks out. They're definitely quite a bit costlier, but substantially more efficient. Gunships up in the air, also helping out, which is always nice. One medium tank does make it into the back line, though. Sometimes that's all it takes. Well, okay. It's gonna keep going. The little medium tank that could. Cloaked, uh... Cloaked metal extractor over here, by the way. Always cheeky, those cloaked metal extractors. Easy to forget about those. We did eventually rebuild all these, by the way, these uh, metal extractors over here. Commander just died over on this side. Uh, that's interesting. Must have died to the lightning turret over here. Poof. Uh, or maybe it was the gauntlet up here? Yeah, it might have been the gauntlet up there, either. <laughs> Brown player is recovering. Slowly but very steadily. Need to have these metal extractors handed over. Could also do with handing over some energy. Always very helpful. Glad to see at the very least, though, that we are getting these T2 metal extractors up and running. Suddenly, the T2 does push back. Lightning tanks are coming out, and they're a decent option here. But those welders are quite sturdy, and they can hit back with those lightning strikes. Very potent, very capable frontliner. And of course, with the hounds in the back line, this is just about a perfect armada com composition. Radar and radar jammer bot are the only thing I can think of that would really vastly improve this. Everything else would just be icing on the cake. About as tried and true of an armada composition as you can go for, the welder plus the hound. Equivalent, I guess, in Cortex terminology to the sumo plus Sheldon. Hound's walking blindly into this commander over here. It was uncloaked for a second, so if they were paying attention, they might have seen it. Not going to be the case, though. Jaws Munch does degun down quite a few of those hounds. Going to blast away a couple of these welders as well. Interestingly, not going for the degun there. There we go. A bull is out. And I think the bull will be quite nice. Meanwhile, a couple of tan fiends have snuck through. By the way, the pink... Or the... My goodness. Are you done yet? Are you done yet, Quaff? Anyway, the tank commander sneaks a couple of fiends through. Uh, this burns. This burns quite badly, pun well intended. Yeah, those fiends, man, they are really, really tricky to deal with. They get into your backline, and especially if your wind turbines are way too crowded right here, like we do see out of the green commander Mimi, they're gonna light up like a Christmas tree. Just like that, the entire economy here for the green commander burning down. Oh, just barely not. This construction turret saving the day by repairing one of those so they didn't chain react. Absolutely could not have come closer right there. But my goodness, please space out your wind turbines. Otherwise, you never know what might happen. A couple of fiends might sneak through and you might end your day with just about zero wind turbines left in the bank. So what has the blue team accomplished with this tremendous advantage that they've had here? So far, not much. We've afforded, at the very least, a T2 transition for our frontliner jaws much here. For the time being, that, T that T2 transition will be enough here. My goodness, do you have enough energy converters? You need about one of those for a fusion reactor. Oh, we're still going for advanced solars and advanced fusions. Should definitely choose one or the other here. The fusion, much more efficient, but obviously quite a bit costlier. Almost always easier to go for fusions for a little bit of early game scaling, or uh, mid game scaling, I should say. This uh, plasma, I agree, has been incredibly OP up on this mountainside. Blasting away at everything in the vicinity here. Completely pushing back the forces over on this side. Recluses are quite nice, though. Recluse is definitely one excellent answer to deal with all that up on the hillside. They're also quite good against these tanks, if they can get the right angle here. They have it for the time being, but as soon as this battle shifts, this could be really, really dangerous. Ah. Man, those recluses sting. Heavy tanks really feeling the burn as those medium tanks do take on the rocket spider barrage. Commander goes down over here. It's the Cyan Commander. Roof. Come on, man. You can just degun him. It's all right. Nobody's going to watch. Nobody's going to care. Go ahead and degun. There's no shame in it. Oh, we actually have somebody leaving the blue team here. Uh, what on earth? Yeah, okay. Looks like uh, Roof Mac has taken over for the frontliner here on the blue team. I believe that was the purple player? Yeah, it was the purple player. Decided not to play anymore. Not sure exactly why we decided not to play anymore, but either way. 
There are good options against this sort of a thing. One would be a lot of Mauser. Because those Mauser would be able to fire away into the back line, they can definitely be quite effective. So many Hounds here, though, that if you're not taking out the Hounds while you're also taking out the front line, you're effectively going to be losing way, way too many of your units. Every bull that goes down here feels like a win. The Welders feel a lot more sacrificial, even though they're quite a bit more expensive. The fact that they're just a whole hell of a lot easier to uh, keep alive just because they have so much more health somehow makes them feel like they're more disposable. I don't know. Hard to explain. The gunships on both sides have been really intense. We've got quite a lot of those Banshees, which is really surprising. We don't often see the Banshees being used quite so extensively. Res Spider out here to reclaim a whole bunch of this as well. Sorry, not Res Spider. EMP Reclaim Spider. I always think of it like a Res Spider because that's what Res Bots typically do, but that's not exactly what it does. Mauser. Sitting static. Not ideal, but also if you move them around too much, they can't actually fire. So this is just about as good of an opportunity as you're going to get here. I like the Pulsar back here, the Starlight Bard and me back there. Firing away as much as he can. My goodness, this gauntlet hasn't been killed yet. I feel like 10 Banshees should be able to come over in this direction and ruin this gauntlet in about 5 seconds. Maybe that's just me, though. We do have an air player, yeah. Kraz Krazrad is going to be playing as the air player here. Or has been playing here as the air player for the blue team. Maroon Commander definitely with a lot more pie in the sky here. Yeah, I mean, this is the hard part about playing air is knowing exactly how much your enemy has and doesn't have. Right now, what the Maroon Commander doesn't realize is that if they send all these fighters across... Oh, maybe I spoke too soon. If they send all these fighters across, they have more than enough to break through the defensive lines up in the air here for the blue team. And they'd be able to bomb essentially without intrusion. We could certainly take out quite a lot in the back here. There's not, like, a tremendous amount of anti-air. Yeah, we have a little bit of chainsaw action right here for the Powder Blue Commander. We have a little bit of anti-air kind of spread around. Overall, though, not a crazy amount. There we go. Yeah, fighters thinking about it. There we go. Yeah, fighters are going to head across. Beautiful. These are the kind of plays you have to be making as the air player. It definitely feels uncomfortable to lose this many fighters over on the other side of the map, but if you're doing damage, then it's definitely an acceptable loss. Bomber's now headed in. The fighter's effectively acting as the scout craft here, so we could either choose to go for some of this squishy economy over here. You could certainly carpet bomb this area to smithereens over on this side, but I guess that's not what we're going for. Uh, yeah, there it is. Oh, well, uh, oh, we're fight commanding. You never want to fight command. You always want to hit uh, A and then right-click and drag to spread those dots out to wherever you actually want your bombers to attack. <laughs> ah, damn. The uh, Maroon Commander a little unfamiliar in the skies, it would appear. What a bummer. Because this could have been an absolutely killer bombing run, but at this point, Flak has had more than enough time to come up, so yeah, that uh, Flak turret's going to be more than happy to blast away at a bunch of these bombers. Eventually, some bombs are going to connect with the blue base at the very least here, and finally, the wind turbines go up in smoke as well. My goodness, this could have been one, two bombing runs, followed by a third and maybe a fourth. Bombing is quite tricky. Takes a little bit to get used to. Do we even have any bombers left? We have two bombers left. A single pair of bombers. That is all. So despite that crazy advantage in the early game, the red game or the red team is clawing themselves back here. The red team actually with a metal advantage because they've claimed a lot of their metal extractors. They've also got a decent eco player on the back line here. Yeah, looks like Lollington is well aware of the kind of eco that you should scale for. Going for triple Aphus right into the T3 lap. I like that we have a plan here. We're not just building Aphis after Aphis after Aphis to try and out-eco the enemy without putting any units on the line. We're actually going for some sort of T3 tech, which is always good to see. Interesting that uh, the Red Commander hasn't gone for more eco here, although I guess part of that is because their player on front of them has been completely wiped out of this game, so they've been frontlining for essentially the better half of it. That medium takes breaking through, showcasing exactly how those uh, recluses fall off right there as they can't hit the units that are running parallel to them. Fat Boy's now marching out. We've seen a lot of Fat Boys. I feel like in the very last cast that I put out, which, uh, you know, I'm sure each and every one of you has watched, the, uh, the Fat Boys made a stunning mass appearance in that one as well. I wonder if those are becoming a little bit more of a popular unit nowadays. Surprising that we're just now seeing this T2 Metal Extractor coming up right here. Definitely a little bit slower than usual. T2 fighters are being produced in mass right now from Krasrad, so eventually these T2 figs are going to be quite good against the T1. It is still just T1 in mass right here for the uh, Maroon Commander, although we could fix that. 
Uh, we certainly should fix that. No reason not to go for T2 fighters. They are vastly more efficient. Almost always well worth going for. There's almost no reason to go for T1 after you've gone T2. Except maybe if you need mass constructors or you just want to make up a whole bunch of cheap scout planes. When those bulls can land their connections into a big cluster of units, it's really, really staunch. Uh, and by that I mean it's uh, very powerful, very good, very efficient. However, one to one, those bulls are not exactly a killer unit. Bastard over here trying to fire away at whatever it can. The blue team being pushed back, pushed back by ticks. Ticks and two Mausers pushing back the entirety of the blue team right now. Is this a comeback? I think this might be a comeback. The red team certainly making a concerted effort to continue growing, continue scaling here. Feels like the blue team has sort of taken their advantage for granted, and now it's slowly slipping away right now. The worst part is I don't think the blue team realizes it. I don't think they're quite so aware of exactly how bad their advantage is falling off every, every second right now that they're not going across and doing damage. Demon now about to hit the front lines, and that'll be terrifying for the blue team to fight. Only T2 for the time being. At the very least, we do have a couple of sharpshooters here. Definitely not enough to deal with that demon. Uh, well, I say that. Four sharpshooters might actually be, like, almost just barely enough. I want to guess it's probably six is the magic number, but certainly blasting a huge chunk out of that demon's health is quite helpful. Ah, we're going for the advanced solars here. I, I think we definitely need to reclaim these advanced solars and put them into fusions. This whole thing could have come up quite a bit sooner if we had just built a little more build power in the back line, as well as also going for, uh, yeah, quite a few more of those uh, fusions as opposed to the solar panels here. I mean, if you look at the metal storage, 3,700 is almost the full price of a fusion reactor. So think about that. You could have uh, an extra 250 energy for just a little bit more metal. There we go. I heard explosions. Over on the left-hand side, the uh, inherited first base of the, or forward base right here of Roofmock. This is not their original base, but sort of the one that they uh, inherited from their donor on the front lines. Starts to take some damage. I have a feeling this base has been well neglected, though. These labs, the metal extractors, everything has been uh, kind of left to ruin. Always tricky to micromanage all that, but almost always the best option is to just eat up the base of the teammate that you acquired, especially if it's right in front of you like this. Just eat up all that metal and turn it into some extra economy for yourself and start pumping out a crazy amount of units. You'll end up in a good spot in no time. Exploiters over on that left-hand side. Pitbull is up as well. Not bad. Pitbulls can be a little underwhelming, but when you build them in mass, they can be quite effective. So a word of caution to those of you out there who might be tempted into a tick spam. If you're going to engage a tick spam, it prompts your enemy to build defenses and makes them more prepared against further spams of units. If you're ever going to start a tick spam, you always want to make sure that you have some sort of follow-up. Mass sharpshooter, always a great one. Hounds here could certainly do some work as well. Essentially what I'm saying is you always want to make sure that if you turn on your tick spam, you want to get some value with it. You don't just want to be running it emptily. You don't want you don't want those uh, precious metal per second going down the drain for effectively vision of an enemy that you already have perfect radar vision of. There's also spy bots out, so no reason the spy bots couldn't be the vision here. Ticks are incredibly cheap, but 100 of them per second can start to add up quite nicely, quite painfully, depending on uh, who's paying for it, I suppose. There is no daddy's credit card in Beyond All Reason. You gotta pay for it all with yourself. You, yourself, and your own. Surprisingly stagnant right here for the yellow commander, though. The yellow and tan commander. We already have two demons. Well, one demon. The second one about to hit the front lines here. We really can go. A third demon is on the way as well. Fourth even just got out of the lab over there. My goodness, the mass fab is quite nice. Yeah, Wallington just showing exactly how powerful that late game eco scaling can be. Nowhere near that kind of eco scaling in the back right here for the blue team. Explains why it's so important to have somebody who really appreciates how desperately you need that sort of eco scaling to uh, really have an effect in one of these games. A spy bot connection right there, but no follow up. That's what I'm talking about. If you're not if you're not following up that kind of EMP or the the scout spam or anything like that. 
you've effectively just wasted resources. Stop killing stuff, says the, uh, <laughs> says the blue commander. Interesting. Not the play I'd go for. I'd definitely encourage killing stuff. Particularly enemy stuff, but to each their own. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> Fiends taking a direct missile to the face. Unfortunately, it was a missile from one of their allies right there. Demons do have a little anti-air backpack right here, so actually these gunships are going to get shot out of the sky pretty quickly. There's a little bit of anti-air in the back line as well. That chainsaw firing away those anti-air missiles. Blasting down whatever it can here, and now those three demons are going to push forward like it's nobody's business. Green demons at the very least are out right now, and these sharpshooters have contributed a lot. Click, 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 and the sharpshooters do blast down those demons right here. Thank goodness for these sharpshooters is the blue team thinking right now, because otherwise... This would have been a nightmare. Ooh, Razorback just barely goes down right there, as well as the demons. Can we get about 30 resbots to pick all this up? I think that would just about equalize all this. Heavy tanks pushing forward on this left-hand side. Fat Boy actually getting some juicy connections over here. What the Fat Boy lacks in raw single-target DPS, it definitely makes up for an AoE DPS. So if you have a big ball of tanks like this, it can certainly put in some tremendous work. Good old-fashioned heavy tanks. Might seem, uh, you know, a little bit plain. But what does it matter if they make it all the way into the enemy backline and there's absolutely no response from anybody and suddenly they've done a whole bunch more economy damage? I'd say it's well worth it. There you go. Amex goes down as well right there. We love to see it. Our air player is Armada, so certainly we should have at least four or five EMP bombers on standby. Essentially necessary if we're going to play Armada. There we go. We do have some EP bombers. Bombing this frontline spam right here. Could go after that big ball of lightning tanks as well. Maybe allow the spam to jump on it. EMP bombers are definitely one answer to the... Why are we attacking the ground over here? Oh, no. Well, okay. Anyways, EMP bombers are definitely one way to make that tick spam actually viable. Uh, I saw a nuke, by the way. Yeah. Nuke is charged. Where are we putting it? Should probably fire this thing pretty quickly. The red team, fabulously protected by anti nuke here. The only thing unprotected right over here is on the right hand side, uh, as well as in the middle of the map. Ah, okay, and that's where we're gonna put it right here, right in the middle of this yellow facility. Loads and loads of T2 vehicles here. About to realize what it means to meet their god. And boom. That is fabulous. Opens up that entire lane right here. If we just go for a little bit more aggression, you know, the starts are going to be tricky to push through, but they are on the retreat now, which means they're invalidated, which means the Razorback is going to have full say to push on forward. T3 production stopped over in the back line here, which is a bit surprising. Oh, it didn't stop. It just switched over to a behemoth. Well, it's quite expensive, but eventually when it hits the front line, it'll be stalwart. Do we have any Ragnaroks coming up or wall cannons? It looked like they were talking about it in the uh, spectator chat. <laughs> I think they lied to me. I don't see one. There's back. We'll be blasted down here eventually. Tremor also firing out into the middle of the map over here. <sighs> Please stop this. Please. Why? I saw the cursor over here. I see the cursor right here. What are we... <laughs> Why are these firing at nothing? I'm so confused. I'm so, so confused by the unit micro over there. Another nuke right here would actually be tremendous. Take out all these Sheldon as well. Any units that are out exposed from the uh, anti-nuke field could definitely be well worth it. Mass Shiva coming out now from the Tan T3 printer. And I think, frankly, Mass Shiva would probably be enough. Maybe Mass Karganath might serve a little better. But Mass Shiva would certainly be enough. Essentially, whichever team decides to print units right now is the one that's going to win. Another nuke up in the air. No anti-nuke fired. Are we putting it in the same spot? Looks like we are. Looks like we are. Beautiful nuke right there. Man, that was just perfect. 
Wiped out all those T2 vehicles, all the rest of them that have been pumped out right there, as well as a whole bunch of these Sheldon. Sig whoa, pardon me. Significantly cutting down their numbers. Really, really nice to see. I'm so offended by these welders. I don't know why, but it bugs me so much. <laughs> uh, this uh, has no vision over here, so it's just being barraged by these infinite tremor spams. Down it goes. The tremors were within range, so there's no reason they couldn't have been caught. Antidote. Intercepts the ballistic missiles sent out by the red player. And there we go. As predicted by the spectator chat, indeed, there's a wall cannon up and coming right here. Have we any such gun for the red team? Doesn't look like it. That means the red team's on the clock. These tremors should not be as big of an issue as they are, but they were allowed to push forward and they took an inch. When you give a tremor an inch, it'll take a mile. Now they're knocking on the front door. More like banging on the front door. Drumming on the front door, maybe an even more appropriate response. Love the pimples out here, but definitely not ideal against a bunch of ticks. Preferably, it's for LLT. <laughs> Quite a bit cheaper, too, which is well worth noting. Do you have a jammer up here? We do have a jammer up here. So a little bit of a micro tip, by the way. In case you're ever going for, say, for instance, a, uh, a wall cannon like this and you need to build it and you're using a whole bunch of T1 constructors, remember that the T1 constructors use uh, radar, or rather they are detectable by radar, which means that you want to put a jammer down first and foremost. That way, any stray radar signatures don't accidentally detect every single one of your constructors that's building over there. It's a dead giveaway that you're building a Ragnarok and it will almost always be met with retaliatory force. You're quite vulnerable when you're going for a Ragnarok, as you can see over here. The Green Commander completely exposed right now with the economy entirely going into building this Ragnarok, although not entirely. There's uh, actually quite a lot of metal overflow right now. We have so much, and it is doing so little. 20,000 metal for a behemoth. For what you pay, the behemoth is actually a fairly efficient unit. I know 20,000 metal is quite a tremendous amount, but the fact that it is so sturdy and can blast down just about anything in the game in just a couple of shots. Yeah, I would say it's uh, probably one of the more efficient units in the game, actually. Especially for T3 late game. 30 seconds or so left on this. We are sending constructors here more and more every single second. Love that we're expanding that, at the very least. Energy storage is coming up as well, always important. We have enough energy production right here. Uh, 93,000? Yeah, I think that's probably enough. That ought to do it. How far can this cannon shoot, though, is the question. Oh, just about everywhere on the map right here. Could certainly take out everybody in the back line right here for the red team. Might even be able to sneak a couple of shots through the canyons over here into the back of the, uh, red, the uh, orange and pink team. Or orange and pink player, pardon me. Where are we targeting first? Red player is going to be the first target. Very nice. Energy converters go up. Aphis is in a lot of trouble. Not quite done yet, though. Yeah, we're uh, bouncing off this shield right here, which is a little bit inconvenient. Doesn't matter, though. Red team base does go up in smoke right here. Finally, we're going to fire onto the uh, tan base as well. That's not actually where that's located, though. Yeah, not going to matter. <laughs> Any stray projectile that does hit those aphises is going to cause a tremendous amount of devastation. The red team has one opportunity. One chance. Will they capture it or will they let it slip? Right now, it looks like they're eating mom's spaghetti because there's absolutely no way that the amount of damage so far is going to be able to meet up. We need so much done by all this T3 over here, and I just don't know how they're going to do it. Airbase pops over here for IM Merlin. That's the Maroon Commander going down. Shields are built in the bases over here, but shields definitely don't stand up against the uh, the siege from one of these wall cannons here, especially not one shield. One or two. You need about ten or so. There was never a definitive answer for whether you could out-shield a uh, Ragnarok seems like the idea is you just have to keep building shields, and that's the only way to outshield them. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Jim James with a massive Deegan over here. It shuts down that behemoth, and I think with that, shuts down the entirety of the 
push over there on the left hand side. Demons are great and all that, but there's just not enough of them. There's just not enough sustain. The sharpshooters are going to work as well, blasting away a whole bunch of this expensive T3. Juggernaut is out over here on the left hand side. That could be a good target for another D gun over here if we have one. Uh, looks like we don't actually. The blue team fairly low in commanders at the moment actually. We're still building constructors. We need to turn that off immediately and just go ahead and go directly into spamming this uh, Lulkin in as much as possible. There's still a couple of targets here, but what does the green player see? Uh, not much. Not much. Juggernaut being blasted apart by a whole bunch of these gunships as well as racebacks on the ground. Looks like we're going to kill this the old-fashioned way. Sharpshooter is also quite nice against the Juggernaut. You can see them leveling up quite a lot as well, which is always nice. Boom goes the Juggernaut. Takes down all those gunships as well as a whole bunch of the rest of the static defense and whatnot around it. But all said and done, that does of course leave a 17,400 metal corpse lying right on your doorstep that I'm sure the blue team would be more than happy to eat up. Well, the nuke up in the air. Anti-nuke will intercept this one. Finally the yellow player. Tired of losing so many of their resources. Throws in the towel and builds an anti-nuke. Learn faster than I do about that anyways. We just gotta drill through these bases here. Slowly but surely this uh, Ragnarok will punch through the shielding of the yellow commander. I think we're a little too slow on the switch up here and also we are dumping a grand total 3,000-ish energy up to 6,000 energy. It's a lot. We're dumping a lot of our energy right now into building a whole bunch of construction craft. If we're going to use these to build things around the map, I guess I don't mind it. But for the time being, all it's really being used for is building more constructors. We're up to some total of 81 right now, so at the least there's that. Razorbacks can kill Juggernauts, just takes a hefty surround. They all blasted down pretty quick, though. Gunships in the air for activating that flanking bonus is also quite nice. Oh, oh, here come those constructors. <laughs> and down they go. Yikes. That was an expensive investment, only for it to be squandered. This lull cannon for Jimmy Jim James is consuming 50,000 energy, but we should have a production of... Oh no, we only have a production of 21,000 energy. Oh, okay. Not enough aphises to continuously fire this thing, I suppose. Time to build some more, I guess. You uh, have the metal for it, you might as well. Throw down an extra two or three or four. I am skeptical about the lull cannon at this point. Feels like it's essentially been able to achieve jack diddly squat for the last couple of minutes here. Definitely huge to be able to pop those bases in the back line, but they are slowly recovering. And you give them a chance to recover and suddenly you've effectively made your enemy harder to kill by prompting them to build shields everywhere and then eventually uh, start pumping out some of those higher, higher level units to kill your lull gun. Yeah, I mean, Shiva are marching across the map. Thors are falling closely behind. Shiva can obviously be paralyzed by the uh, Armada air player. Thors, however, not so lucky. Or so lucky, I should say. I'm sure the Thors feel quite nice about not being able to be paralyzed. Definitely one of their better traits. That and their sheer width. Tremendous. Tremendous width. Down go the Razorbacks. One by one. Thor's rolling into the base right now. My goodness. Don't tell me. Don't tell me all this Ragnarok. Uh, calamity, pardon me. But we're not going to be able to close out the game. We have Titans over here. Oh, and a bunch of stealth tanks. 
a whole bunch of stealth tanks rolling in. Oh no. There's a bunch of exposed energy converters right here. These energy converters will pop, opening up the doorway to get to the fusion reactors. Those will go away, meaning that the Aphises are going to be wounded, which means that these stealth tanks have an even better time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, don't tell me. The Thor has still yet to be stopped, and the stealth tanks are already in the back line. Yep, there they go. Stealth tanks crawl their way into the back line. Gonna bypass the, uh, yeah, bypass the fusion reactors altogether. Probably a better decision right there. Let's go ahead and kill the Aphis here. Let's go ahead and... Well, I guess we're gonna kill it with one of these other ones. Okay, sure. Sure, why not? Yeah, pop all those energy converters, and then suddenly there's no unit production over here. Aphis does go down over here to the Thors that push forward. My goodness. What a cheeky little play over here. Shutting down the economy from the left-hand side while there was no units guarding it. Using those stealth tanks to sneak on through opens up a crazy opportunity for the hot pink commander. Everybody's production shuts down, and the red team manages to clutch it out, even after being destroyed from that law cannon. Their aggression was unparalleled and they managed to put it all out on the field. Granted, having that tremendous comeback recovery period, the blue team definitely should have claimed victory there. They definitely snatched a little bit of defeat from the jaws of victory after that tremendous early game push that eventually got fumbled into a late game victory here for the red team. My goodness. If you enjoy these games or you enjoy daily Beyond All Reason games, I always encourage you to subscribe up to the Beyond All Reason Brightworks YouTube channel. Always fun to have you here. It's the only Brightworks channel, by the way. I said that in a way that might insinuate there was more. Just the one, and it's run by yours truly. Sure hope you have a great rest of your day. Sure hope you enjoyed the cast, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.